hello again. Uh, thank you for um, being here twice today. First thing I'm going to do with you is talk about competitions. Uh, this right here, what we're going to do is a little game. You're going to be judging. Uh, the show was judged and hung and over and everything else. This was back uh, a couple of years ago. Um, Phil Block and Steve Rooney from International Center for Photography judged it. There's always a uh, controversy with judging. And I'm here to talk to you about like personal taste and why you should not be too upset if you get rejected somewhere and why you should not be too happy if you uh, get, get accepted <laughs> somewhere because it's all subjective, OK? So these are from the um, 13th International Crappy Camera Competition. And the, the entries come from all around the world. And it's everybody's using a really <coughs> horrible camera, not just old, but they're plastic. They're toys, they're plastic, they're homemade, they're, uh, they're, they're crappy cameras. So uh, let's just get started, because I don't want to take too much of Lois's time here. Yeah, okay. So the way this is going to work is here are three pictures. I'll show you three or four at a time. And you're going to very quickly do a vote on which one you think is the winner. OK, so the one on the left is number one, then two, and three. Who thinks number one? Three. OK, who thinks two? And three? three. That's the winner. You're all wrong. <laughs> Most of you are wrong. OK, next bunch. The one top left is one. The one down at the bottom is two. And the one on the right is three. OK, number one? Number two? Two it is. Number three? Well, it's pretty close between two and three. And the winner is number two. OK. The next one, next bunch. I'll give you a second to look at it. All right. One, two, three. Looks like we picked three. And you're right. OK. Uh, next bunch. Number one, number two, number three. Uh -huh. Number one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the top one is the top left. That's one. The one on the underneath it is two. So number one, number two, number three. OK, next one. <coughs> Take a minute to look. Number one, two, three. Three. Two. Oh, two, sorry. <laughs> Number two. Here we go again. Well, all right, all right. All right. I knew all right so for the, for the people who weren't here on the first, the, the five of you who are new, they're the only ones that can vote. Number one, number two, number three. Somebody told them. Somebody, somebody told. OK, so actually, here's, uh, I, you know, these, these were not just entries. In the, these were the winners. The, the, the 50 winners or so that were in that show. And I just broke it down into um, those categories where uh, those were the ones that won awards. OK? All right. We know the one on the bottom left won an award. OK. So anyway, let's start with um, uh, um, honorable mentions. So we're not going to do the, the voting right now. But there were three honorable mentions. So take a look at these pictures. So actually, that's the lowest of the, uh, you know, of the groupings. So uh, there were three of them. So look at these seven and pick out which you think did not win first, second, third, or the Holga Inspire Award. Got your picks? Those were the honorable mentions. Um, yeah, I know. Who had picked any of these for a prize award? Yeah, I know. They, they were all wonderful. OK, so here's the next four. This one, we're looking for third place, OK? So of these four, which one do you think came in third? What? 
Oh, right. You're saying the color one? Okay. Two ladies? Two ladies came in third? Okay. So we got everybody thinking something else. We all know that it's not the one on the bottom. There's the third place. Andrea Millet from, uh, again, see, she's using a Holga. Okay, so here's the next batch. And we're looking now for second place. <laughs> it's either the middle one or the one on the right. Okay, so we're saying the one on the right. We have a mixed bag here. Ay, ay, ay. The ladies photographers. Okay, and here we go. We're looking for who won first place. <laughs> Pretty obvious, right? Okay, yes, this is first place. This is Tim Smith. And uh, Tim, where are you? Tim is here tonight. Oh. Tim's, uh, you know, since then we, we did a print exchange and have become friends. And uh, so there's a great lot of, lot of good bonuses of being uh, involved in competitions. Um, so that leaves, of course, Chris Hankey as the Holga Inspire Award winner over here. So I wanted to just, we, we went through a little bit about Chris Hankey, why he was selected for this, as the judges looked at all the Holga uh, uh, you know, pictures from this batch. Um, they picked Chris Hankey, and a big part of, part of it was because of his website. So there's just a couple of little... Uh, a few of his pictures from his website that uh, show this particular series. It shows the depth, it shows the investigation, it shows all sorts of things about him. But now when you're doing a competition, which is one of the things that Lois is going to talk to you about, getting it out there, um, the, uh, the um, judge may be looking at thousands and thousands of images. They're not going to sit there looking at every, everybody's website for that type of competition. So here, Tim, um, works with his Holga, and I'll, I'll uh, go through his work and I'll show you why, how he strategized this competition. So this is something you don't normally see at all. You never know what the judges are doing and how they're, how they're picking things and what they're even seeing, because nobody gets to see like all like 1,500 pictures, just the judge and you know people like me who put it together. So here's his, um, he sent in, you're allowed to send in uh, I think it's five images for $40, and then it's $5 for each image after that. He sent in, this is what he sent in. He sent in these four, and these four, and these four, and there were more. I only picked 12. There, there were more there in that first round of pictures. So he sent them in, um, you know, where you could send in up to five, he sent, he, he added more on and spent the bucks and sent in a whole bunch. And if we go back to look at these pictures, you can see how they're all related. They're, they're pictures in the street, they're of people, there's something interesting going on with each one of them, which only happens after you do this all the time. So Tim, just very quickly explain your process of how you shoot. Nice and loud. <laughs> what you were doing when you did this project, very, very quickly. I, I walk down the street with my camera using my waist and so I'm five feet away from people and I snap the shutter. And at the end of the day, I've got two to four rolls I develop it and see what I get. Okay. And you do this how often? Every day. Every day. Okay, so you can imagine, so he's got like this, this arsenal of, of of images to look at and to work with. And he's shooting film, because he's shooting on a Holga. That means having it processed and scanned and, and doing all that. So it's a lot of work, but he's in that, that's his workflow. And one of the things the judges have said to me, and this is over the 20 years that we were doing this, you know, that I was running this competition, the judges have said, why am I looking at these five pictures that have nothing to do with one another? And I said, well, we don't have a rule for that because you, you only have to pick one. He goes, well, why would somebody put in five really wonderful pictures and then this horrible one at the end? And I said, well, I don't know. Or why is this, there a landscape and a portrait and a, an abstract and a still life? And I said, I don't know. They don't have to put them into a, there it is again, that cohesive body of work. The judge saw Tim's entries, 
didn't know who he was, there's no names, but he saw those, I think he, I think he even had about 16 or, or 18 pictures that he submitted in this category here, in this, in this um, under that entry form. And the judge saw this work and said, here's somebody who's really looking and knows what he's doing. Because he could see the string, he could see the time, he could see, and it's not even he, it's they, it was two judges that year. They could see this whole thing stringing through his work, and judges like that. So think about what judges like to see. They like to see a lot, or a, a, a thread. They like to see that cohesive body of work. This would have not looked right if one of them was in color or if he picked 18 pictures that he was going to submit and he just had them going all over the place. But he wanted to do that. He did want to show more work. So what does he do? The tricky guy. He signs up again and sends in another batch of work. Here's his other winning entry. Okay, so he won first place with the two women in the street. And I love the title of the work. It was called OMG WTF. <laughs> perfect, perfect. But then he had other work that he wanted to show. So he, there was maybe 12, about 12 pictures in that category, in, in that entry form also. So you can enter a competition more than once. It's all money, right? You know, it doesn't even matter if it's the same name. They don't care. All right, so here you go. That was his one, one in winning entry. But here's the next body of work. You see how it's a little different? There's a different flavor to it. It's all Tim, but it's, it's, it's all the same and it's all different. And these are shot in your apartment? Yeah, yeah. His stairway in his apartment. You just notice the light every day. So the other thing about having to go to great lengths to take great pictures, you don't have to go farther than your own backyard. Okay, you really don't, like sometimes just at your kitchen table of the coffee mug that you drink out of every morning could be an award-winning photograph. It's what you do with it, it's not what you're shooting, it's how you're shooting. All right, so I just wanna show you some other pictures that were done with plastic cameras, so to dispel the myth of having to have high-end expensive equip equipment except for that new Nikon and the new Olympus. <laughs> so this is Susan Bowen. Uh, she's also a member of Soho Photo Gallery, but she's kind of, she took a workshop at um, ICP on Holga, and she said it was kind of lame, it was kind of dumb, blah, 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 but the only thing they had there that was really good for me was they showed how to shoot on a whole roll of film as one picture, and you just kind of shoot and advance, shoot and advance, shoot and advance a little bit. So you can do that with a, a cheap camera. You can't do that with a good one. So these are her pictures, and she's actually gotten commissions to do these um, all over the country. Here's just two examples. They're really stunning because she, she scans them and puts them together, and she, th some of them are like, you know, she can do them up to like 20, 30 feet long. So she, she, she does, yeah, they do some really beautiful uh, corporate work from her personal work, okay? Uh, here's another one, Jeff Smith, also a member of Soho Photo Gallery. He works with this, this dollar store camera that he got years ago, it costs a dollar. So here's two pictures that he took with that camera, which again, are not that great, but Jeff is um, primarily a visual artist, not so much a photographer. He's a collage artist, he's a construction artist, he's multimedia, yeah, he, he can do all sorts of things. Photography is not his thing. So what he did was he took those two pictures, ran down to Staples, okay, had some copies made, and created that. That's from those two pictures. No, no software involved. No software, it's all hand done. <laughs> Jeff sits there at his table with an X-Acto knife and a cutting board and a ruler and some uh, roll attack glue and assembles these things and they're big. They're like maybe five feet by five feet, four feet by four feet, they're huge. Again, no, not, not, no cost is involved here. And he gets the pictures developed like at CVS or something like that. I mean, he doesn't even do anything. He doesn't even use the picture. He takes, he takes the picture and has a color Xerox copy made. And one of the things he's, you know, he's griping about is that, oh, this one, this machine makes things a little too blue, this machine makes the little things too green, so he 
uses that to, to, to work these, these collages. So this one is just a grating that he found, a, a metal grating somewhere. That's the picture. And there's the final picture. Now that black thing in there is just a shadow, because that's kind of three-dimensional. It sticks out from the, uh, from the picture, and uh, it's just a bad shot of it. But you can, you can see that grating, that picture in there, how he's used it. He, has, he prints some of them uh, forward, and then he you know, does a symmetrical flip of the image. And again, all hand done. And this one I just love. This was his cat, Fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> that he was crazy about, okay? But instead of just using that picture, he turned it into this. Pretty incredible. Can you see the cat in there? You have to look. The cat that's that's the picture. Cat soup. Yeah, the cat is in there. That is that's the cat. You have to find a corner somewhere to to put the picture together. Yeah, the paws are all coming together. Right. <laughs> and here's a few more of Jeff's. Jeff and I like going to cemeteries, so he, uh, he shot a bazillion um, pictures of cemeteries, of the mausoleums, of, the, some, of the, some of the stones, some of the pictures that are on the, um, on the stones, and uh, creates more of these beautiful, beautiful pictures. So that's all. I just, my message to you is, again, don't be too thrilled if you win something. Don't be too upset if you lose. You saw with that first part of the um, presentation how subjective it is. Uh, the judges have personalities and likes and dislikes. We had a show one time where somebody was working on his own stuff, and everybody that had a picture of a dog got in the show because <laughs> it had something to do with his own stuff. So you just have to, you know, Lois will talk more about that. OK, that's it for me. I'm handing you over to Lois now. Here's Lois. <laughs> yeah. As you can see, um, I, had to, I had to cross out the word finding here because I thought it made it sound too easy. You, you know, you're not just going to walk down the street one day, see a gallery, and walk in and say, gee, I'm a photographer. And they say, great, come on in, show me your pictures, put them on the wall. Um, it's really a lot more work than that, and that's why it's, you're, you're making this journey. You're making your place. Uh, whatever it is, it's, it's, you'll get there because you've done the hard work to get there. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, portfolios. Uh, and that's, the, well, the reason for the mountain. I don't know if you could see the B&H sign, but uh, um, <laughs> you know, just to show you that this is a bit of a trek. It's not, it's not easy. So we talked a little bit about portfolios earlier, and um, we're talking about a cohesive body of work. And that's, that's a term that you don't often see or hear other than in photo. Um, so I, I was trying to think of ways to you know, give you an example, and for some reason I came up with poker. I don't even play poker, but um, you've got two hands here. Okay, anybody know which one is the winning hand? Straight flush. Right, straight flush, okay. Um, and the one on the right, though, has the same, the same uh, characters, the same value. Each one of those is the same, numerically the same value. Um, so when you're talking about a portfolio, you want, you want that royal flush. You can have 12 to 15 really great images, but if they're a mix of genres, say the, the hearts are um, portraits, the, the diamonds are landscapes, and the spades are uh, uh, street shooting. Okay, You don't want a portfolio that's made up of three different genres of work or three different types of work. You want your portfolio to look like that straight flush. You want it to be a winner. You want, you want people to look at it and know that every one of those images works together and goes together. Um, and it's, it's your vision. So when you're putting together a portfolio, we talked about the images. You need you know anywhere from 12 to 20. Um, 12 to 15 is fine, too. It's not, you know, it really depends on the gallery or um, how much work you really, I would never put in more than 20, because uh, you're just going to bore people to death. 
So, um, so when you, you we're talking about the portfolios, when you when you put your portfolio together, the images are the most important part. You have your images, you have them matted or not, depending on how you want to show them. You put them in your box, you bring them somewhere, uh, but. They need to know more about you. It's not just about your images. If you're going to, a, especially a commercial gallery, they're going to want to see what you've done. They want to know a little bit about you. Um, and it's something they're going to want in writing. They're going to want, anybody ever done a resume for a job? I would think so. Well, you need a resume for your portfolio as well. As a photographer, you need what's called a curriculum Vitae. Okay. I never knew how to pronounce this, so I put it up there for you so that you know how to pronounce it. Uh, and basically, it's your artist resume. But it will include, aside from your name, address, your contact information, it'll include a link to your website. It'll include a uh, any education you've had, whether it was strictly photo or any education. They want to know kind of more about you as a person. Um, and if you've had any exhibitions, this is where it goes. They want to see solo exhibitions first, uh, then any group exhibitions you've been in. If you've gotten any grants or awards, if you entered a contest and you, and you won an award for that, this is where you show that. Um, any media and publications. If, as a result of that contest, your, your picture got published in a magazine or a newspaper, you will also put that in. Um, after that, they'll want to know what professional activities you, uh, you have. Uh, and that's relating to your photography. So if you were a member of a, a, a photo club, if you're a member of um, uh, like the PWP, Professional Women's Photographers. If you're a member of a gallery, uh, already a co-op gallery, uh, anything that you've done professionally uh, and you would put you know, on a resume as something that you want people to know about, uh, that would go there as well. Uh, if you've gotten a residency, has anybody ever applied for uh, an art residency anywhere? No one. OK, well, there are these things called residencies um, that a lot of the um, art colonies, schools, uh, art places, they will, they will actually give you money. You, you have to send in a portfolio and all this information, uh, and you, generally a statement about what you're going to use that residency for. And sometimes it's, it could be just a little, uh, in some of these art colonies, like the Anderson Ranch, or um, uh, there's another one out. Virginia? Oh, yeah. yeah. Pen, um, pen workshops. There's a, whole, there's a book called Artist, Colon Artist Colonies or Art Artist Communities, and you can apply for these. And they'll give you money to go and just stay there and do nothing but artwork. Um, it's, I know it's quite a concept. It's, um, it, if you have the time, it frees you up. You, um, you can go, and some, some of them run from you know, just maybe a week or two, and some could be six months. Uh, and it's international. You can apply for residencies in, in all over the world. And, uh, and it's generally sponsored by uh, some organization that likes to promote art and, um, you know, and has a real um, desire to, to really promote culture and, and bring culture into, into the world. And, and they're letting artists, they know artists have a hard time. Um, so they, they let artists come in and use their space. They have, sometimes they'll have equipment for you if you want to print. Um, and it's not just photographers, it's writers, painters, um, you know, work, working clay or bookmaking, whatever, whatever art field you're in, there's a residency for it. So if you're interested in something like that, you should uh, go online and do a search for artist residencies and you'd be amazed at the amount that come up. For some, there is a small fee, like they, you'll have to pay your way there, but otherwise they'll, they'll house you and feed you for the time you're there. So um, commissions, that's the next thing on the list. If you, someone has ever commissioned you to do artwork um, for their store, for their company, for their magazine, um, this is a paid commission is, is a nice thing to have on a resume. 
collections. Uh, you can list any public or private collections that you're a part of. So if a gallery, if after you've applied um, to a show or something in a gallery, or keeps your work as part of their collection, you're now in that permanent collection. If a, a corporation, if a, you know somebody says, oh, I need, you know, they put out a call for work for, to decorate the walls in their offices, you're part of that company's collection. And there are some companies that really go out and actively look for artists, and, and they have some very, um, very high-end collections, and they're worth lot, you know, millions of dollars, and they're always looking for new artists. They, you know, it's, it's a way for them, I guess it's a tax shelter at some point, but, uh, <laughs> but it's also, they're people who love art, and they want to put something on their walls that, that will make their employees happy and their customers happy. So that's another venue that you can look into. Um, so you can, this is a, kind of a basic curriculum vitae. vitae. Um, and, and there are many different samples online, but this pretty much covers the basics. I don't, you know, you don't have to have everything in there. You know, if, if you have, you know, if you don't have a commission or in collection or residencies, that, that's fine. Uh, you know, that's not the be all and end all. You just, it's just a matter of them looking at this one sheet of paper and knowing who you are and what you've done. Um, so when you bring your portfolio in this box, it should also include this curriculum vitae. <laughs> Someday I'll get it right. Uh, <laughs> along with that, you're going to need an artist statement. Okay. So your artist statement is your view of your own work. Um, it's written in the first person, which means it, you say I. Uh, and it's generally part bio and part uh, description of your work. So if you're sending a portfolio somewhere, you will, in that description, you will just describe the work that's in that portfolio. If you're talking to someone in general and they want an artist statement from you as part of a, uh, a program or whatever, you can give a general statement as to what your work is in general, what kind of work you do, um, what your, you know, if, you've, if you do several different kinds, you can list those. Um, but in general, if you're, if you're bringing a portfolio, you should be really specific to the work that's in that box, why you did it. Uh, what was your, what was your, um, the impetus for, for creating this kind of work? What's your, you know, how does this work make you feel? Um, how do you think you want viewers to react to this work? Anything that you can, anything that you, you think about that work should be in that statement. It should, that's, it should not be, you know, six pages long. They just want a short statement that kind of tells, um, first of all, they want to see if you can write. And um, and they want to, and they just want to know how you view your own work. It helps them when looking at your work. Uh, it's not an autobiography, however. So you know, a few lines about you, your education. That's that's fine. Uh, but it's not like oh, I was born in a hut, you know, in the South Sea Islands, and now look where I am. Yes. <coughs> Can we hold questions until? Uh, okay, I thought there was a hand up. Okay, um, it should never reference the equipment you use. You know, like I shoot with a you know, Canon 5D Mark III and this is what I got. Um, unless it really pertains to the technique that you're using, if you're doing a really unusual technique and you've used something in that technique that they might not be aware of, then you can reference it. But they don't care what kind of camera you used. They're only looking at the, they're looking at the final product. They're looking at what what you made with whatever camera or you know device um, that you used. If it could be a still from videos, it, it doesn't matter. To them, it's all about the final product, the image. So leave all your technical jargon out of there. They don't they don't care. They don't want to know, um, and um, and you just want to streamline for them. They want to get through this quickly. 
Uh, you can also go online and look at other photographer statements. If you go to different websites, very often they'll have a statement with the image. I, on, my, on my own website, I have several different bodies of work. And for each body of work, I put a statement pertaining to that body of work. <clears throat> if you do, because um, I, I kind of jump around with different bodies of work, but if you do one specific kind of work, then one statement is, is good, you know, in general. But it should, but it should be on your website. Speaking of which, uh, self-promotion. Uh, you're your own best advocate when it comes to promoting your work. No one knows your work like you do. No one knows why you do your work. Um, so while you're out there, it would be nice to have a, a card or something with your website on it. And website doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be that much. It can just be a very simple uh, couple of page website. You can also use, um, you know, Picasa, Flickr, Google Plus. Keep it very simple. I think we've said that before. Uh, it should not include every image you've ever taken. I've gone to websites where they have like, you know, like maybe six thumbnails, and you click on a thumbnail, and a hundred images open up. I go to the next website. I don't have time for that, and certainly a gallery doesn't. So um, if you want to, the, the website should just have the best of the best. Um, if you have a lot of different portfolios and maybe just four or five images from each portfolio, you don't have to show everything. Uh, it just kind of dilutes the work. So uh, and if you're on your website, you should also include the uh, statement, uh, your CV, and very important, your contact information. If you want, if somebody sees something on your site, they need to be able to get in touch with you to, to find out more about it. Okay, that business card I talked about, um, it's called branding. I know it's, uh, there's, it's, it's not just you know having an identity. Now you have to be branded. Um, so you know you need you definitely need business cards. Uh, you know if you want to go the stationery and promo card route, you can do that. Uh, whatever you do, make sure it's a clean, simple design. Don't fill your card up with a lot of information. That's what your website is for. You know, your name, your contact info, maybe an image. Um, oh, and don't fet forget your QR code. Does everybody know what a QR code is? OK. You see the front of this card? You know that, that, that weird little square full of squiggles? You see it on a lot, of, a lot of cards. That's a QR code. Don't ask me what QR stands for. It's a QR code. And basically, this is your digital signature. If you, um, people have a, a phone that they can scan QR codes, they scan this little thing, and it takes, you, it takes them right to your website. It's great. Um, you can go to www.qrcode.com, or there are several other websites that do this. And what you do is you just put in your website address, and it converts it to this little icon. And it's specifically for your website. It's free. And then you, you download this little image and you put it into uh, whatever promo packet you have so that they can always get to your website. Yes? In, in the App Store, if you're using a phone, uh, Red Laser is one. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of them. So you can just do a search in the App Store. <coughs> if you're using a different type of phone, just search your, who you can download it right from there. Okay. Easy. Easy peasy. OK. Um, and again, as I said, use a clean, simple design. And choose a font that's easily read. Um, too many times you see cards, you know, promos with this fancy font. And you, you, know, you, you have to like, hold it here. And your head is reeling from the, you know, the confusion of, of the, the swirly letters. Um, it's not about the font. You're not designing uh, this card as a statement of your artwork. This card is simply to direct people to your artwork. You want to make it as easy to understand and read as possible.
Okay. How many here have a Facebook page? Okay. How many of you have a fan page? How many of you knew there was a difference? <laughs> I didn't for a long time. I, I kept going to people's fan pages, their Facebook page. I don't. Apparently, a fan page is the better thing to have. Um, I just have a Facebook page, but if you want to promote your photography, a fan page is is the better thing to have because uh, people will you'll be liked. Yes. Um, so you know everyone wants to be liked, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's very gratifying to be liked because at that point they may say, "Oh, I like this person. I'm going to send it to someone else I like." And everyone that they're friends with, friends with will see that they have liked you and will go to find out what they liked and why they liked you. So it's, it, it's kind of a self-propelling uh, promotion campaign. You get people to, to look at your work and then they kind of, by magic of Facebookdom, it, it goes out to everyone else on their, on their, um, their friends lists. And so it's, uh, I know, it, you know, I'm sure anyone, every, anybody here under the age of 40 probably has several Facebook pages already. Um, and um, okay, and how many of you Twitter? How many of you tweet? Ooh, we have a lot of tweeters. Okay. Um, I have a hard time saying anything in under 32 <laughs> letter uh, characters. I mean. <laughs> You know, as a matter of fact, it's a signal. If I start talking too much, she's going to go like this to me, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> tweeting is, I try. I try very hard. But it's just, it's just not worth the effort. I'm, I don't think in snippets, you know. Um, but if you can tweet and do it, and do it well, um, it's, a great way, it's a great thing to do because you get people who follow you. And the more people you follow, they will then in turn follow you, and then the people that follow them will also follow you. It's this, this, this web, oh, a worldwide web of uh, information out there that um, you really takes very little in your part. You just have to, you know, send a tweet out every once in a while, put a picture on your fan page once in a while, and in a couple of months, millions of people have seen it, if you're lucky. Uh, and maybe one of those people will say, I want to see more of this. I want, I want to get this person into my gallery. Uh, or I know a gallery I think this work would be perfect for. You know, it's, there's a lot of um, karma involved in this <laughs> and a lot of luck. Um, so it can't hurt to be as social as possible. You, no one else is going to say, I like your work, let me go promote it for you. Not without wanting a lot of money from you to do that. So if you can do any of this, Google Plus, I just joined Google. How many in a circle? How many circles do you have? It's just too confusing. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's Google plus medication. <laughs> There's just too much to think about. You can't, I mean, yes, I'm on Facebook. Yes, I, I tweet. To add circles to that is just too much for this brain, you know? Uh, but if, you're, if you have a brain that you know, thinks that way, um, it just, you just invite everyone into your circles. And then they will invite their people into their circles, and then their people will see your people, and you know, kismet. Um, then a blog, you see? Yes, you got a blog too. How many people blog? Wow, this side of the room is doing much better. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> you're very social on this side of the room. You know, you guys, you know, come on. <laughs> um, See, now you can blog about how social you are. You can say, I, you know, oh, I tweeted this and this happened, and then I, I was, my Facebook page got liked by so-and-so, and who knew that would happen. Uh, then when you have time, or if you have time, you have to go out and shoot every day. 
So this is a full-time job right here. You know, if you think you're going to get away, you're going to get gallery representation or get your work seen or noticed by just sitting at home on your computer, like, no, dodging and burning, <laughs> it's not going to happen. This is a job. This is something you have to want. And you have to want it so badly that you're willing to give up a social life. Uh, unless it's unless it's online. <laughs> oh, but I, I want to go back. Does anybody know what half of these things are? WordPress, Vimeo, Tumblr, Blogger, Blogger, right? Okay. Behance. Oh wow! Oh yeah! Oh, oh! You know what? She should give the next workshop because she's got all of these things going on. Yeah. See, I. This is where I go like this. You know. You know the eyes start going around. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> a community with other artists. That's really important because most artists, you, you know, you, everyone has this conception of an artist or a photographer, you know, like being this lonely soul and they're, you know, they, they give up everything for their art and they, they starve in their little, you know, hut or garret, you know. Um, not so. Uh, you need people. You need other people. You need like-minded people. So. These B and H workshops are a, a, a gift, you know, to be able to come somewhere where you've got a lot of people interested in the same things you're interested in and learn things not only from the presenters but from each other. Uh, to be able to talk to other photographers and and see what works for them. Uh, what what are you doing? What and not so much equipment. I, I know well, every time you get photographers in a room, eventually it gets to well. What are you shooting with? Well, now I'm shooting with this, but I used to shoot with that, and it was so much better. And now I wish I could do that. And did you see the new one that's coming out? It's just it's never ending. Forget the equipment. Just forget it. It's it's really irrelevant <coughs> to image making. Your images are made up here. You know, the fact that you've got a tool that can take those images and put it on paper is wonderful. But without the image up here, you've got nothing. So talk about photography. Talk about art. Talk about the shows you've seen, other photographers you've met, other work you've seen. Um, camera clubs are useful to a point. Uh, <laughs> again, it's a community. Uh, I don't see the point of ha rating your work every every show, but every uh, week. But um, but it gets you if it gets you talking about work and talking about art. It's it's always a good thing. Local art councils. Um, I don't know where you live, but generally most communities have an art council. They they promote any kind of art. They generally run some kind of competition. Um, and they're always looking for volunteers. Go and join an art council. Uh, maybe you don't have to be one of the people who does a lot. You just go to meetings. Get to know other people in your community. Um, it's a good way. You might, get, you might get a bunch of people together, and somebody has an empty store they know about. Let's do a show. You know, it's like, you know, when you're a kid, let's build a playhouse. Well, you know, I've got a space, you've got work, let's fill it. You've got a show. Without all those other people involved, that won't happen, you know? Um, take classes, there are the adult education classes, there are uh, workshops, you know, um, you know, there's main, the main media workshops, there's the um, Im <laughs> image factory workshops. Uh, <laughs> Um, Woodstock has amazing workshops. Just any place that you can go. ICP, you're right here. I mean, you've got everything at your fingertips. The more you learn, the more informed you'll be. The more informed you are, the more sophisticated your work will become. And, and that's a good thing. So I feel like Martha Stewart. I keep saying that's a good thing. But, um, <laughs> Okay. 
Get creative. Alternative venues for your work. Um, one, of the, one of the best things you can do is enter competitions. I know it's hard work, it costs a lot of money, but as you heard before, um, it can really be rewarding. It can be your step or your foot in the door to a lot of different places. Um, you know, you won't, you won't always win. You won't always place if you do get in. But if you don't try, you don't know. And, and you never know who's going to be looking at that competition. We, you know, at Photo Photo Gallery, at Soho Photo Gallery, we do competitions all the time. Um, it brings a lot of people into the gallery. It's, it, there's a lot of buzz when there's a, a competition show. And you never know who's going to show up to come and see the work. You know, it could be another gallery owner. It could be, you know, someone who's a, um, an interior decorator who's looking for work, you know, who is looking for work to put on walls at their clients' walls. Um, you've got to get the stuff out there. You can approach local businesses. So after you have your cards or if you have some promo cards made, you can ask them if you can leave, leave your cards with them, especially if it's like an artsy area. Um, some people will go to local businesses and even ask f to put work on the wall, have a little mini show, you know, coffee shops, things like that. I think you have to be careful about too many of those things. If you really want uh, more commercial gallery representation, these kinds of things don't hold much weight with them. So if, it's, if you're just starting out and this is how you want to do it, fine, but I wouldn't make a habit of doing it. Um, donate work. You know, there are charity events. Uh, if you're involved in a charity, they can have an auction. Donate work for the auction. You know, somebody will buy it, put it on their wall. Somebody will come to visit them and say, where did you get that? And before you know, you've got a sale. Um, it, it's for that one little print, because you're not, certainly not going to donate something huge, but you know, something nice. But um, it may open a door for you. Participate in group shows that come your way. Because again, you'll never know who's going to show up. Uh, anytime you have a chance to be a part of a group show, if somebody says, oh, we're having a show, I'd like to invite you, do it. You know, again, maybe not in the coffee shop, you know, but galleries have group shows all the time. Sometimes they have invitationals. Um, we have three, three well, all galleries have an invitational. Um, if you, if you go to those galleries all the time, you get to know the people, they see your work, someone may invite you to show your work at their gallery. So again, you have to be an extrovert, not so much with personality, but with your work. Your work has to really get out there. It has to be seen. And the only way it's going to get out there is if you kind of get out there with it and, and push it. And not, you know, um, I, I shouldn't say push it because you don't want to, you don't want to get pushy, you know, especially not with a gallery owner. But um, but you want to you want to um, motivate people. That's a better way to put it. Okay, what's the right gallery for you? Um, you have to have a history with the gallery. So. Are you familiar with the kind of work they show? Uh, do you think it's a good fit, and why? Now, you're only going to know these, the answers to these questions if you've been to that gallery, if you've attended openings, talked to the owners or the curators. Um, if you continue, uh, if you have a relationship with a gallery, you go, suppose there's a gallery that you love. You, every time you walk by, there's something in there you like. You think your work would be perfect in there. You don't walk in and say, I have a great portfolio for you. You go to the openings. You find the owner. You find the curator. You, you talk to the artist. You talk to the owner about the artwork. Um, and and they, they know why you're talking to them. They know. You, the minute you say you're a photographer, they know you, know, you want your work on their walls. Um, but they're not even going to look at a portfolio from you unless they feel that you have a commitment. So you can't come in off the street, go to an opening, 
and trying to schmooze the, uh, the owner, you know, like, oh, I love this, I love this. You know, I have great work too. You know, I'd like you to look at it sometime. First of all, he's in the middle, or she is in the middle of an opening with hundreds of people around, is not about to stop promoting the work that's on the wall to talk to you about your, you know, thousands of images that, you know, might fit here. Um, you have to know when to kind of hold back. Uh, to use the poker metaphor again, you know, when to hold them and when to fold them. <laughs> um, you have to pick your moment. And your moment is generally after you can go into a gallery and know something about the work that's been on the walls for the past year. You know, uh, you know people there, you walk in and you say, hi, you know, Jane, how are you doing today? What, you know, what's, what's the upcoming shows? What are you, you know, uh, what are you planning for the future? Um, then you can ask, or you can ask even beforehand, but you can ask, uh, are they looking at new work? You know, some galleries, um, you know, like um, Howard Greenberg Gallery, I, I, I don't think they're looking for new work. <laughs> you know, I don't think they're looking for the hottest new, you know, hipster print guy. Um, they, they want established, you know, um, the photographers who have been around for a long time, preferably dead. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I worked there for a short time, and, and it was amazing because I got to hold, you know, prints from people uh, I had never even heard of. Roman Vishniak at the time, I didn't know who he was, and I just fell in love with his work. Uh, Kenro Izo, Izu. Um, they have, they have, they have so many. I got to hang Mary, Mary Ellen Mark's work. So I, I know the kind of aesthetic that they, they're going for. I would never walk into them with my work, into that gallery and say, I've got, you know, I've got work here, would you look at it? My work does not fit there at all. You know, maybe when I'm dead, but even then, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> um, so, but you might want to go into some of the newer galleries, the, the um, you know, galleries in Brooklyn, there's a lot of, you know, newer galleries there. And see what kind of work they're showing. Again, get this rapport going with the people who work there. Even if it's just somebody sitting at the desk, you don't have to talk to the owner right away. Sit, talk to the people at the desk. Uh, ask if they see new work. What are the requirements? You know, what do I have to do to get my work seen? Um, and you have to think, from their point of view. They're a business. They're out to make money, okay? What can you offer them? Have you sold any of your work? Does your work sell well? Uh, who do you sell your work to? Uh, if you've never sold anything, they'd be taking a huge, huge risk because the risk is all on their end. You produce the work, you know, it might cost you, you know, a few bucks to make, make the work they're doing their hanging, they're, they're paying rent, they're paying heat and electricity, they're paying for publicity, um, they're having openings, they're laying out huge sums of money to get your work seen. So it's got to be something that they think is sellable. So the only way you're going to know that is by looking at work that they, they show on a regular basis, getting to know who they are and what they sell. Um, they may, if they see something in your work, I mean, it's happened where they'll, they'll look at a portfolio and it might be a new artist, some, somebody they've never seen, but they, they see something in there, a spark. They may say, you know what, this is really good, but it's not where I want it to be yet. Come back later. That's a huge bonus to have somebody tell you that. Um, so you have to know, uh, and you also have to know that they're going to take a commission on your work. So they, they are, you, the work you see in these galleries, they, they go for big bucks, thousands of dollars. But at least 50% of that, maybe 60%, you know, goes to the gallery. That's their commission. So the, the artist isn't always getting as much as you think. <laughs> um, so let's talk about guidelines. When you go in and you ask, do they, you know, do you look at new work? They'll, and they say yes. It's like, yes, okay. Uh, ask, how would they like the work to be presented? 
What do you require? When can I come back with my portfolio? Make an appointment. You never, ever show up without an appointment. Oh, that didn't work. OK. Those words are not supposed to look like that. OK. But if you do, um, if you do everything they say, um, follow the guidelines. Nothing more and nothing less than they require. Don't think, oh, you know what? I'll throw these in, too, because I think they might be interested in these. If they say, I want to see 12 images or 15 images, that's all you show. If they want them matted, you mat them. If they say they don't have to be matted, fine. But then they have to be presented. They have to be printed. Uh, you know, they have to be pristine. In other words, there's, they have to be beautiful prints on beautiful paper with a nice white border around the edge. So maybe they don't have an over mat, but, but they have that matted look to them. Um, Yes, they'll generally, they'll generally tell you what they want to see in a portfolio. They may not say what size, but they may say nothing bigger than, you know, you know four feet. Every gallery is going to have a different set of guidelines. It's not, they don't all get together for dinner once a week and say, okay, what are you asking for? What are you asking for? You know, they, each gallery is a separate business, a separate entity with a separate owner and their own ideas about what they want and what they want to see from you. So you have to make that effort. You have to find out about the galleries. Uh, again, you have to do your homework. Um, and when they, they're probably going to want, uh, if they want prints, they have to be beautiful prints. Um, they may want to see a CD first. I, I don't know. I don't. But if they do, the images have to be sized according to their specifications. They're not going to wait a minute and a half for your, you know, 122 megabyte image to open. Um, so you're going to follow the, the instructions, either prints or CD, how they want the images presented, either in the prints or the CD. You will include a written, your, your CV, curriculum vitae, uh, and a statement about that body of work. You will include printed copies of each of those and you will if you if it's a CD you will not only will you include the printed copies but you will include a copy of that document on the CD so when they open it up everything is there okay every image should have a title you know and if you want to label it like your last name and title or last name it doesn't it doesn't matter it's just so that if they call if they say I love this image and they call you and say I want this and you say, which one? They'll say, well, it was the fourth one in the box. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't have a title, they're not going to, you know, you're not going to know. So have a title. Um, also, you should include, when you're putting work on a CD, all of your images should have your contact information in the metadata. Anybody not know what metadata is? Good. OK. <laughs> so all right, well, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, this is the information that's in your file. It's part of your file. When you take a digital image, there's a certain amount of data, like the type of camera, the date, all of that. It's in your file. And it's great to have all the information. But if, they, if you don't have your contact information in there, they may look at your CD. Now, this is a, a gallery owner told us this, um, that what he would do is sometimes people would drop off a CD, and they would look at it. This was in the years when you could just drop off a CD without making an appointment. But, but they would look at it, and it wasn't right. But some of the images were interesting. So, so say um, they have a landscape show every year at this gallery, and you had a couple of good landscapes. He would take those files and put them on his computer in a folder labeled landscapes. When it came, comes time for the show, to, you know, to, they're thinking about the show and what works they're going to put up. They, he looks at your image, he opens it up, and there's no information in that metadata. Your name is not there. Your contact information is not there. There's that, show, that image is not going to be in that show because he couldn't contact you. So apparently a lot of people do this. They may just take, they may just pick a couple of images 
they like the images, they may, the whole body work might not be right for them at this time, but they may save some of those images for later on. Always have your contact information in the metadata. If you're working in Lightroom or Bridge, you can always add it in at that point, okay? So, um, if you do happen to get uh, an appointment to show your, your portfolio, you, you bring your portfolio in, you let them look at it. Uh, they may want to discuss the images with you. They may not. They may want to say, you know, I'll come back in a couple of hours or come back in a few days. Um, when you get your images back and they talk to you, whether they want your work or not, you send a thank you note. Uh, it's just good manners, and it might make you stand out from a thousand people who didn't send a thank you note. Uh, and stay in touch, not, not meaning not just don't drop by every day and say, hi, remember me, you know. <laughs> uh, but one gallery owner said that she was, um, that somebody said, she looked at a portfolio, she liked the work, it wasn't right at the time, uh, but they had a nice conversation, and this woman now sends her, sends the gallery owner every year, she'll send a card with a little image. And so she's always on her mind. And, and she says, I keep those because if there's something that comes up where I need, you know, images like these, I'm, she's the first one I'm going to call. So a little niceness, a little, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not even more, it's manners. We, you know, it's something we don't talk about much anymore, but, you know, you have to have good manners. You have to be a nice person. You can't go in expecting them to want your work. Uh, you can expect them to, if you've made an appointment and they, and they decide to meet you, you can expect them to, yes, look at your work and comment on it. That may not give you a, an in-depth portfolio review, um, but they took their time. They, they're, they're working, all right? This is their business. They took time out of their work day to look at your work. Common courtesy, send a thank you note. And if you want to, if you think that gallery is still right for you, or if they tell you, you know, well, maybe, maybe after a couple of years of doing this kind of work, you'll be ready or whatever, just stay in touch. It doesn't hurt. It takes a few minutes, but it could mean, you know, work in a gallery. I'm going to hold off questions. Um, as I said, never, ever drop in for a review without an appointment. You don't. The last thing they want to see is somebody carrying this satchel full of images and opening it up on the desk and saying, could you look at these now? You know, I have a, do you have a few minutes? I have a portfolio here. Uh, you'll never get back into that gallery again. <laughs> um, however, this, this gallery owner did say, a lot, of the, a lot of people say, you'll walk into a gallery and you'll ask, um, are you looking for new work? And they'll say no. He says, it doesn't hurt to have a CD with you. Put your name on it, you know, again, everything in the metadata, and uh, in an envelope. And before you leave, just leave it on the desk. Walk out. <laughs> he said, it's hard for people not to look at it. <laughs> so, you know, so you're not being pushy. They may throw it in the garbage. You don't, maybe they really meant, no, we're not, we're not taking any new work at this time. You know, or maybe they were just having a bad day and didn't want to deal with, you know, another photographer coming in the door. But, so, have a CD ready, you know. Keep some, some pack somewhere. Make a few of them. And it, it can't hurt. It's a, it's a cost of a CD. Um, so, you know, you, you, you be polite. You do what's expected of you. But a, a nice little something, you know, you want to slide that in there that, okay, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't take their time and it doesn't hurt you. Okay. Again, always be polite. You know, you don't go in there saying, well, I've been in a lot of shows and I'm, you know, you, and I think you should look at my work. You know, that, that's really rude. <laughs> you don't, you know, they, they're, not, they're not there to be your, um, 
sounding board. You know, it's, it's like, that's not why they got up this morning. They're running a business. You have to respect that. You have to respect that they have time constraints that you may not know anything about. And if they can't see you, you just politely say, all right, I'll c is it okay if I come back another time, you know? And they might say, okay, if you're polite, yes, you know? Um, I, I don't, I, you know, there may be some gallerists or if the gallery owner's not there and there's somebody at the desk who just can't be bothered, they may say, no, you know, don't. Go to a few openings, talk to people, get to know the lay of the land. That's, that's really um, all you can do. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to get into a gallery now. You know, unless you're about 19 years old and, and do something outrageous. <laughs> um, hmm? Twerk. Yes, yeah, so twerk. We're doing twerk photography now, yes. <laughs> I'm going to bend my photos this way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anybody not know what twerking is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> Just look up, look up Miley Cyrus. <laughs> okay, uh, you've heard us talk a lot about cooperative galleries, uh, and this is another avenue. Uh, we're not pushing co-ops or collectives. Um, we call them artist-run. Um, but it's, an, it's a great way, um, you know, as we said, they, the entry is by portfolio review. <laughs> Sometimes it's by invitation. Um, we belong to a small gallery that was just invitation only. The, the, the owner decided to get a group of artists together and, and uh, it works really well. Um, you have to understand that with an artist-run gallery, there are, there are costs that the that the gallery members have to, um, you know, kind of take care of. So uh, there are dues. Uh, there's also generally you have to docent. It means you have to sit the gallery, or and do some housekeeping, like once a year at, at Soho Photo and at Photo Photo we we have to paint the walls. You know, when you go when you go to it's your turn to sit the gallery, you you know you have to throw out the garbage. You know, uh, this your you're not just a member, you're a co-owner of that space. And, and that's the nice thing about cooperatives is that, um, and as Sandy said, not everyone always cooperates, but the majority do. And because, because you're all there for the same reason, um, both Soho Photo and Photo Photo are nonprofit galleries. <laughs> and our mission is really to get photo out there, you know, as, especially at Photo Photo. We, we started, we were both founding members of that gallery. Uh, it was over 10 years ago. And uh, because there was nothing, there was nothing there. There was nothing in the middle of Long Island for, for photographers. You know, it was either the city or the Hamptons. So we decided to start our own gallery. Um, but a lot of us were teachers and we decided that what we wanted to do was to get photography out there, get, get people who wouldn't normally go to a museum or, gal you know, like in their hometown, get to this, this place that's accessible and come and look at, at artwork. Um, and it's been really successful. We've had some really good, um, we have some really good receptions. Um, we don't get a lot of people coming in off the street. It's generally at the reception, but, but we get a lot of people looking at the website, and, and you know we had uh, almost a thousand images in the competition, so a lot of people are looking at us that way. Um, it's also nice to be, again, I'm going to talk about community. Um, you meet photographers, it's all photographers in the group, and they're, they all do something different, you know, different styles, different genres, they just, there's always something different to see. So that, that community, I can't stress that enough for, for all of you who are, you know, and this, this is a great venue here, but if you've got, if you don't belong to another group, find one, because you really need, you need that, that contact with other photographers. You need, to, you need a sounding board, someone to tell you, you know, if this is working or that's not working. 
and um, you know you can you can ask your husband wife significant other you know and they'll say oh yeah that's nice you know yeah you know, your best friend if she's he or she is really a best friend will tell you the truth but uh, but otherwise they'll say oh that's great you do such great work you know I love that duck you know it's like, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and that was your least favorite, you know. Um, so you get to meet with other photographers, you exhibit your work on a regular basis, um, and you can discuss work. You can get to get, you can sit around a table with other photographers in an informal atmosphere and talk about photography. Um, and, you know, have you seen this show? Have you seen that? Have you seen what this one's doing? It's just, it's a nice atmosphere. It's, it really, and it sometimes it will, it will lead you to a new area in your own photography. You might, you know, you might be a landscape photographer and then you, and, and somebody you know is, is, you know, started doing, you know, um, I don't know, portraits, macro work, whatever, you name it. Um, and you think, oh, you know, I haven't tried that. Let me maybe, you know, let me try it. Let me see how to do this. And, so you experiment a little bit, or you get together and you, and you try a new technique with people. It's that, it's that getting together, it's that experimentation, it's that opening up your, your, your mind to other possibilities um, that you wouldn't, ha wouldn't have if you were just sitting home alone, you know, working on your images on the computer or in the darkroom. How many of you still use darkroom? Oh, okay, all right. Wow. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot. Okay, there's a lot that we've talked about. Um, and it's a lot of work. Anybody think this is an easy job? Okay, it's a lot of work. If, you, if this is truly what you want to get into a gallery, a commercial gallery, it's, it's going to be almost a full-time job. So if you're overwhelmed, I'm suggesting that you do one of two things. You, you create or update your CV. How many of you here have a CV, an artist CV? Not enough. OK, you all need one. You can go online, just put in artist CV, Google it. You'll have lots of different ones. It'll show you examples. Uh, College Art Association has several examples, um, and they're, uh, it's a good jumping off point, all right? And it can't hurt for you to write down all the stuff you've done. You might be very surprised <laughs> at how much you've done. Uh, so you should have, you can either do that, or if you, if you have one and you want to start editing your work, take the work that you've done so far. and edit it down to 12 of your best images that are based on the same theme or idea or concept, okay? Um, is anybody here a conceptual artist? Does anybody know what that means? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, most photographers go out and take pictures, you know, landscapes or this or that, and then they come home and they put them together, okay? Um, where they go out and they shoot, now I like this spot, I'm gonna go shoot here again, or I like that and I'm gonna shoot here again. Some photographers and artists start with the idea. It's like, what, what do I want these images to be about? Uh, I'm, I'm, I tend more to be in that, that end of the spectrum. Um, so I'll, I'll think about, I may, and it may start with one image. I, you know, I, I recently did, I took an image I was bored in, in a doctor's waiting room, and I, and I happened to have a little doll with me. Don't, don't ask. Uh, <laughs> I shoot a lot of dolls, and I found this little one, and I put it in my purse, and it was there. So, so I took it out, and I was photographing it in, in the office, you know, just to kill time. And, uh, and one of the images I liked a lot. So I'm now, that's the jumping off point. That's my, my new series that I have to shoot and print before March 1st. Uh, but so I start that way you know it's like maybe there's a, an image that gets me started but I have this concept that that I'm working on and everything I shoot will be geared toward that particular concept it's all about the idea okay it's not about 
who, what, where, or when. It's about the why. And, and that's something I want you to think about when you're editing. Look at your work and find groups of images that you took, not because they were all taken in the same place or they were all taken on the same day or the same week or you know this was you uh, this vacay this trip to somewhere ask yourself why did you take this image okay and if you can get a lot of images that have the same answer then maybe they'll go together okay start thinking about the concepts behind your images you know you don't uh, you a photograph is, is basically, most people would just say, it's just, it's just a document. It's a document of what was there at that time and place. Okay? But it can be more than that. There's, there can be a lot more meaning in an image. Um, and maybe not in one image, but if you start to put several images together with the same meaning, then you're on your way to a body of work. Okay? Something of substance. And if you, and you, I think you'll see this when you start going around to galleries and looking at work and see, reading artist statements, why they do things. For me, the why is the biggest part of my portfolio. Not what or how. Uh, the, the what, the how is determined by um, the type of images I'm, I'm making. And then once I start making the images, I'll decide how I want to show them, what way will best um, illustrate my idea, you know, or this concept. So I know uh, most of you aren't used to thinking about concepts in your photography, yeah, and you, or maybe you just don't call it that. I think you, you may all have, you're all attracted to certain things. You know, everybody has the, their, their little niche, the thing that they, they want to do uh, all the time. And f ask yourself why you're attracted to it. Why do you like those things? What is it about that that makes you want to photograph it and, and, and keep it forever? You know, it must be saying something to you. I know this sounds a little, you know, weird, but um, this is not a self-help group, but we, we, we try, we try. <laughs> so, you know, it's... There's a lot that you have to do, but, um, and, you know, imagine how your work is going to look on a wall. And don't imagine just one piece on the wall. Imagine 12 pieces on the wall. Imagine that all of those pieces work well together because there's a similar idea or a similar theme or similar, there's something of you in every one of those images, okay? They have to be personal, at least for me they do. All of my images are personal. They're like my children, you know. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to throw your children away because they're ugly. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's a sacrifice you make for your art, you know. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.